Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Oreskes, and this is the Associated Press Davos Debate. Our topic might best be framed as, what keeps the world's leaders and its captains of industry awake at night? A World Economic Forum report says conflict between states is the number one threat in 2015, the first time old-fashioned war has been listed as the top global risk. So why don't we begin in Ukraine? Dr. Ursula von der Leyen is the first woman to serve as defense minister of Germany. Dr. van der Leyen, thank you for being here. NATO says that the rebels are preparing another offensive, and the truce seems barely a truce at all. What's the solution to the Ukrainian crisis? Well, the solution is certainly not a military one. Um, but of course, we keep in mind that the Russian violation of international laws and the uh, aggression towards the security architecture will not be forgotten. Um, and I think this conflict is mostly a conflict about uh, what type of instruments do we use when we have a conflict? Are they military ones? What we see is hybrid warfare in the Ukraine. Or uh, what we answer, will we say um, we need an economic approach if there is a conflict? and want to sit down at the uh, negotiation table and find a solution at the nego negotiation table. And uh, this is what we see at the moment being, um, that the, the economic sanctions, for example, driven by the West, um, have an impact on Russia. Of course, they have an impact on our economy too but they show how much our world is interlinked and uh, what we think will be a way out is convince the other side that the destabilization of the Ukraine will not be accepted, the violation of the international law will not be accepted, but we have no interest in defeating Russia economically, but on the contrary, we do have or we share a common interest in other fields, like, for example, fighting terrorism. So on the long term, to have the perspective, if you return to the negotiation table and if we solve the question, what is our security architecture, we can build up again the economic path we have uh, been on together in the former years and fight together, for example, terrorism, where we have a common interest to solve that. But will Russia understand this, these carrots of uh, better economic conditions without the stick of the possibility of military action? As I said, there is no military solution to that conflict. Um, and therefore, it's, it's a fight of instruments. And I think the, the economic instrument is a quite um, sharp sword because uh, Russia has a um, strong, uh, has, a, has an economy that is very vulnerable where demography is concerned, has an economy that should open up, that should uh, build connections to uh, the rest of the world, that should send out their young people to be educated, to come back with innovations, to bring forward the economy, and they did just the country by closing up. So um, the economy, and of course the, the, the development of uh, the oil price does its own. What you see in Russia also is that the way they act um, has caused an enormous loss of confidence in potential investors. And all these are parts of a lesson to be learned that you cannot go out and be an aggressor with instruments of the last century just by land grab mm. and annexation without any, um, uh, any reaction that is felt by the country who does that. Mm. Uh, Yavad, uh, Mohammed Yavad Zarif is the foreign minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Russia's been your ally, and Iran is itself a target of a very similar sounding strategy of sanctions and economic squeeze. What's your view of how the West is dealing with Russia? Uh, well, I, I think the policy of imposing sanctions has not produced uh, positive results almost nowhere. Uh, and I do not believe that they will produce uh, positive results. They haven't produced positive results with regard to Iran. Unfortunately, uh, our Russian neighbors can't call anybody allies. Iran is an independent country. 
but our Russian neighbors, who are our friends too, have participated in, in the process of imposing sanctions on, on, on Iran, um, maybe uh, without uh, many other choices uh, that they had. But in fact, those sanctions have backfired. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Iranian situation, if you compare it with, with the situation in Ukraine, with which I'm not that familiar, but I'm familiar with our own situation, when sanctions were imposed on Iran, Iran had less than 200 centrifuges spinning. Today, Iran has 20,000 centrifuges spinning. And the purpose of those sanctions were not, were not ostensibly to put pressure on the Iranian people, but to stop the nuclear program. And they failed miser miserably. Had they talked to the Iranian people, had they talked to the Iranian government, the, the chances of success m should have been much higher. Uh, and I think now that they're talking, there is a much better chance of reaching uh, a positive conclusion. Uh, so I think uh, with Russia, it is important to deal with anxieties. It is important to deal with concerns, geopolitical concerns that uh, are on the rise. Unfortunately, one, I mean, the, the name of this top, uh, the, the, the topic of our discussion is, is geopolitics. And we are going back to the geopolitics of Cold War. And, and that is extremely dangerous. That is even more dangerous than interstate conflict, because that is something that we thought we had put behind us uh, some 25 years ago. And unfortunately, we're back at it again uh, with the vehemence probably not seen for the last 25 years. And I see a very serious danger in that. We're going to come back to that issue as well as to the nuclear talks. But before we do, Kasper uh, Rostad is the CEO of Heinkel, the German consumer products company. And you do business in Ukraine, in Russia, in Iran. And I can go on with a list of other places that uh, there have been conflicts. Are you hearing anything that gives you business confidence? First of all, I think you need to be very clear on what you're getting yourself into. And if you want to go as a global company into a number of countries where high growth opportunity are, you have higher volatility. That is the price for it up front. So of course, we know what most of the times so we're going into. And we, of course, review the situation on an ongoing basis. We feel, uh, and we look upon it in three dimensions, legal risk, reputational risk, uh, reputational risk and business risk. And we think that uh, when we look upon these countries, the balance is still okay. But uh, we're in there for the long term. You can't go in and out. And I think that's very clear as a business. When you look upon these countries, you know that you will have issues to deal with. We've been in Russia since 1991. It's a fourth Russian crisis. We have not changed our strategy. And if you don't have the long term view, I think you get very quickly disrupted of where you're going to go. But of course, you have to take the situation into control, no, into consideration all the time. Uh, Eastern Europe is only one of the major trouble spots in the world. Uh, East Asia may well be one as well. Uh, Yoon byung se is the foreign minister of the Republic of Korea. And you've described the rivalries in East Asia as a Pandora's box. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, when I said that, uh, I had the whole world in mind, uh, not just uh, Northeast Asia or East Asia, but uh, East Asia today is quite different from 10 years of uh, post-Cold War era. You know, for the last 20 years, until recently, it was North Korea's nuclear threat and North Korea's strategic provocations that were single most important challenges to the peace and security of Northeast Asia. But now what you're seeing is multiple challenges, multiple uh, crises, you know, all, the, all problems, new problems, all problem, problems like uh, history and territory. But now we have a new set of problems like maritime security, space security, and recently cyber security as well. But at its heart, what you see is now just symptoms. At the heart of this problem is the conflict of interest of the uh, other countries of the new kind of regional order. Rising China, uh, Russia looking to East Asia, uh, Japan uh, are trying to unshackle itself from the, uh, the post-World War, post War II uh, order and uh, masochistic view of history. And North, uh, the North Korea, which is now trying to assert itself as the kind of nuclear weapon state. And the U.S. is now rebalanced to Asia. So, uh, this is kind of return of uh, geopolitics again, or return of history. Uh, so what you see is kind of a complex set of uh, uh, new configuration of forces, new balance of power in Northeast mm -hmm. Asia. So do you agree with Minister Zarif that we're seeing a level of geopolitical tensions that we've not seen since the Cold War? 
Well, uh, of course, uh, we see uh, this kind of tensions all over the world. But I think uh, what you see in Northeast Asia is uh, very much different from what I, as I said, uh, because of uh, this uh, convergence of different interests mm -hmm. at the same time, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I want to come back to that, but be before we do, I do want to bring our final panelist in. Pham Bin Min is Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam. Um, you've also made some comments about the situation in the region. Uh, you, do you describe China's activities in the waters off Vietnam, I guess what you'd call the East Sea, what some of us might think of as the South China Sea. You've called those activities illegal. Could you tell us how dangerous you think China's activities are? Yes. Uh... In uh, our region, the uh, territory disputes is on the rise now. Not only in East Sea, we call it East Sea, or South China Sea, also in East China Sea. And that is uh, the problem for, for the region, but also for, for the world. Because peace and stability in this region, if we cannot maintain peace and stability in the region, it will affect the peace and stability in the world. Why? Because in the East Sea or South China Sea, this is a very important road for transportation of goods through East Asia and from East Asia to, uh, to other, uh, other part of the world. So this road is very important. And anything happen in East Sea or South China Sea will affect the freedom of, tra uh, of uh, transportation or freedom of uh, navigation. And now, I mentioned that in 2014, the parking of the oil rig of China in, not in the ocean, but in the continental shelf, or the exclusive economic zone of Vietnam. And it's a violation of the international law. So what happened here? is the, you know, that could affect uh, stability in the region. So no survey of the important conflict spots in the world would be complete without a little word on the Middle East. Minister Zarif, uh, one of the driving dynamics in the Middle East is the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia, between Shia and Sunni. Um, the world today is mourning the death of King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. He was 90. Uh, do you see the king's death as changing the Mideast's Shia-Sunni dynamic in any way, or the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia? Well, let me first of all uh, repeat our condolences to the people and government of Saudi Arabia on the demise of His Majesty, the, the King of Saudi Arabia. I will be leaving uh, Davos tonight to attend his funeral with sadness. Uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia are too important regional players, and in my view, we do not need to play a game of exclusion. Actually, we should not play a game of exclusion anywhere in the world. Exclusion is a paradigm, is an outdated paradigm that has led us to all these difficulties. But I want to emphasize that the problem in our region is not a Shia Sunni problem, but a problem between extremists and more reasonable moderate forces in the region. Unfortunately, Daesh or ISIS uh, and Jabhat al-Nusra and other extremist groups uh, who claim to be defending uh, the Sunni population in Iraq and Syria have killed more Sunnis than they have killed Shias. And it is important to look at that problem. And since we are talking to a Western audience, I want to ask them to, for, for soul searching. A good number of these people, if not a majority, are coming from Western societies. And we need to ask what went wrong. These are second, third generation uh, citizens of European societies who have turned to such barbaric extremism in our region. And it is important to ask the question, why did, how, how, how were they brought up? How were they trained? So that, I mean, they were not trained in non-democratic societies. They were not uh, raised in non-democratic societies. They were raised in the West. But unfortunately, they are beheading people in Syria and Iraq. 
beheading people they didn't know. And this is a very serious question that requires soul searching. So I come back to the issue that the problem in our region is not a rivalry between Shias or Sunnis. It's a problem of extremism. And extremism has its roots. Its roots in occupation, its roots in, in depression, its roots in disenfranchisement. And we need to deal with them if we want to avert a very serious crisis in our region. Well, let's continue the conversation into the issue of terrorism. Um, and I'm going to go to Dr. Uh, von der Leyen in a second, but let me just finish the thought with you, uh, Minister Zarif. What can be done to curb Islamic State if we, whether, whatever view you see as the roots of this, what's the answer for stopping it? Well, uh, there, there are several answers. I mean, there cannot be a single strategy uh, or, or tactic to, to deal with. Uh, I mean, I, I hate the name Islamic State because it's neither a state nor Islamic. Uh, I'd rather call it Daesh so that people will not have that connotation, uh, at least not in the Western world. We understand what Daesh stands for in, in Arabic and, and in Persian, but, but not in the Western world. Let's at least do you stick. want to do a quick translation, though, for the non -Arab? <laughs> Islamic State. <Right. laughs> but, but, Thank but, you. but at least at least we avoid repeating that. Understood. <laughs> the, that will create this uh, hysteria in the West that Islam is about extremism and terrorism has nothing to do with Islam or with states in our region. Uh, so what, what needs to be done is, first, first of all, stop supporting them. They continue to be supported, unfortunately. They continue to receive assistance. They continue to be pawns in a geostrategic game of regional dominance. And that should stop. People should abandon this notion, this perception, uh, in my view, this illusion that they can even make short-term tactical gains through using Daesh uh, as an instrument of pressure against other states. We need a very serious soul searching, as I said, in the West, so that we stop the recruitment, uh, fertile ground for recruitment. And that comes from economic inequality, uh, disenfranchisement, the feeling of deprivation that exists among some people in, in uh, the outskirts of, of major European cities. And, and that, has, that is an important source to dry their human uh, recruitment source. And also to have a concerted effort to deal with them militarily, because this is a military problem. And it cannot be done by bombardment. It has to be, we need to empower the governments on the ground to deal with them, rather than simply trying to use uh, aerial bombardment in, uh, as a means of dealing with them. So we need a multifaceted, coherent strategy to deal with this menace. We shouldn't have allowed it to emerge. It emerged as, a, as an instrument of undermining states that were not uh, to the liking of some other states. But, but be it as it may, we cannot uh, go back and we cannot remake history. Uh, history has happened, and, and we need to try to resolve the problems in the future, and I believe that's the way to deal with it. Dr. van der Leyen, is the West responsible for breeding its own nightmare? Well, we share a common, um, common interest in fighting the causes and the sources for that. Uh, I want to emphasize that there was a soil in Iraq on which ISIS or Daesh could grow. That was the soil of an exclusive government that excluded some groups. And uh, therefore, it is good to see now that the Alabadi uh, government focuses a lot on an inclusive policy, Sunni, Shia, Kurds, and the other groups, which is the absolute right way to go, because this is the goal uh, for a um, peaceful uh, life together. And, uh, Yes, the second factor is that ISIS, with this um, way to uh, go forward in an extremely brutal way, has the myth of being undefeatable. This attracts a lot of young people, also foreign fighters, who have a lack of um, self-identity, who have a lack of purpose in life, and seem to be attracted by this so-called um, ideology. Therefore, at home, 
we have to go to the cause where uh, where's the lack of um, perspective, where's the lack of purpose. We have to dismantle uh, this myth of uh, being undefeatable, and this has to be done on the ground by because uh, ISIS is a aggressive force. It has to be fought and uh, um, fought back by, uh, for example, uh, on the ground, the Iraq army or the Peshmerga who are doing that in a very, very, very courageous and brave way. And um, you're right with the third part. In the region itself, ex especially, especially for the Sunni population, there needs to be, of course, a perspective of economic development, of jobs, of lowering the unemployment, of taking part in empowerment in the government itself. So we have homework to do at home in uh, the Western and European parts, but uh, the solution will be uh, at the moment itself fight back ISIS on a military context, but knowing on the long term the solution will be in the political inclusi <coughs> inclusive way to go in that area and economic development. And there has to be a strong, strong interest of the um, players around whether it be it Turkey, whether it be it your country, whether it be it Saudi Arabia, just to fight this enemy there because this is um, a common sorrow we have, a common interest we have, and there we should work together. Please. Well, um, what is missing in our debate uh, right now is the problem related to FTF, uh, foreign terrorist fighters. Now already 82 countries were affected by these uh, FTF problems. Uh, my own country has uh, now one pending case, still we don't know. Uh, what is the actual state of, state of affairs now. But uh, we have adopted a very important resolution at the UN Security Council September last year. And as my colleague from Iran has said, uh, we need a multi approach a strategy to combat this uh, new, new face of terrorism. Some people say that uh, for the last 20 years, we talked about uh, non-state actors. Now some people say that this, we are not talking about non-state state, whether you like it or not. So this is a... Uh, this is a problem we should tackle uh, jointly and with, uh, with, with uh, very urgency. Mm. Uh, Dr. van der Leyen, do you believe what happened in Paris a few weeks ago will happen again in Europe? Um, we, it might happen. So there is no 100% security that it will not happen. We do our best to prevent it, but uh, this is very, very difficult because each foreign fighter coming back is a potential aggressor uh, inside. So we have to be very, very cautious and attentive. Hmm. You've been to Afghanistan at least three times mm -hmm. to visit uh, German forces there. It's been 14 years since the attack on the World Trade Center that triggered that war in Afghanistan. Yet here we are, still fighting terrorism. What was the point of that war? Oh, the point was at the beginning, of course, to fight the, the, the breeding cell of Al-Qaeda. And um, we have been successful um, because Al-Qaeda is no more the basis for uh, this huge aggression. It has been years and years before. We've learned a lot in Afghanistan. Also, what uh, the enabling of Afghan forces is to take care of their own security. We build up right now to uh, put a lot of focus, beside the military intervention, to put a lot of focus on economic development and social development and capacity building in the government. Um, so um, this is, even if it's a very, very hard way we've been through and a long way still to go, it is a good example to see that we always need this comprehensive approach and not only the military one. Sometimes the military is necessary but um, on the long term, we need this comprehensive approach, approach of capacity building of the government and economic development. And um, the, 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 the uh, ISIS phenomenon shows that um, these extremist movements um, occur in regions where you have either an exclusive or excluding policy or you have failing states. Therefore, we should, we should put on the long term a lot of emphasis to identify in vulnerable regions the strong states, the anchor states, and make sure that they get not weakened 
but that we reinforce them and we stabilize them. And this will be a task in this region, for example, to identify the stable anchors to make sure that they keep their influence and they stay stable. Mm -hmm. And whose job is that to identify? This is uh, the, the world's community. I mean, if you see now this new alliance of more than 60 states fighting ISIS or Daesh, uh, we have a common interest. So we see that besides the, the uh, institutionalized alliances, we have new alliance with a common interest to uh, defend our values and to fight this uh, emergent threat. Yeah. Mr. Ross said these struggles obviously are very disruptive to business. I think you lost a facility in Aleppo in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the idea of stable states that must appeal to you. No, I, I think that uh, you have to put the situation into perspective. We are, as I said before, present in most of these countries. And I was just trying to do some um, thinking back. I've been CEO for almost eight years in the company. And we have lost more people through car accidents in the West than through uh, war in the Middle East or Asia. We have lost more plants through burnings or electricity accidents than through bombings. So I think you know, that is one way of looking upon it. And I was speaking to a senior leader a couple of years ago here in Davos, and I was trying to get a better understanding of the situation in the Middle East and that in the context of stability. And he said to me, Casper, your definition of stability is very different to our definition of stability. And I think you need to understand that. So in that context, I actually believe that business can play a major role in countries where you have high volatility because we offer jobs. We have a good jobs, we create stability in society, but you only do that if you're there for the long term, and you also don't pull out. So when things like this happen, and unfortunately we have a great uh, experiencing in disaster situations, the first and foremost thing that we care about is our people, because you can rebuild a plant, you can't really rebuild the people. And if you do that very, very consistently, you can actually build a lot of you know, strong leaders and a lot of local support, even in countries where you have a high level of unrest. Uh, Minister Zarif, let me ask one last question on terrorism. Um, the bombing of a Jewish center in Argentina in the early 90s is back in the headlines. Uh, and the issue is this. The Argentine president has been accused by a prosecutor who then died under rather mysterious circumstances of trying to cover up the alleged involvement of Iran in masterminding, masterminding that attack. Was Iran responsible in any way for that attack or involved in a trade deal that was part of a cover-up? Well, it's interesting. Uh, uh, there was an unfortunate incident in Argentina in the 90s, if I remember, early 90s. Uh, and uh, it's been rehashed and rehashed by, for domestic consumption. Uh, it's a domestic struggle in, in, inside Argentina, a domestic debate. And Iran has been unjustly brought into this. We had an agreement with the government of Argentina uh, a few years ago. Nothing was secret about that agreement, and that agreement involved. Uh, it was under the previous administration. I had no part in it, but it, the agreement with the, uh, with the Iranian government and Argentinian government involved uh, certain steps that each side uh, should have taken in order to resolve that issue. Of course, Iran always believed that it was accused unjustly of this, but we were prepared to cooperate with Argentina in order to resolve that issue. And that agreement was transparent. That agreement went to uh, the, the parliament of Argentina for approval, uh, and the parliament turned it down. So uh, there is nothing conspiratorial about that. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that certain people try to keep this alive in Argentina in order to uh, make a political mileage out of it. And it has nothing to do with Iran. I believe it, it's mostly domestic uh, Argentinian uh, political uh, debate or, or competition or whatever else, rivalry, whatever <laughs> else, else you want to call it. It is unfortunate. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, several prosecutors who came to this were either accused of uh, uh, corruption or uh, have committed suicide, as, as the latest case is. And, and it is unfortunate that certain people try to keep it al uh, alive in order to prevent Iran and Argentina uh, from enjoying the relations they should enjoy. Mm -hmm. According to the Argentine president, the question of whether it's a suicide is still open. But well, we don't need to pursue that here. Uh, at this point. I, I, I'm not an expert about what right. happened in Argentina. That's, I just read the press. Right. Good luck to you. Um, <laughs> Let, let me move then to a couple of other very important geopolitical issues. Let's, let's talk about nuclear proliferation for a minute, because that's obviously important, uh, both on the Korean Peninsula and uh, 
uh, in the Middle East. Um, Minister Zarif, I understand that you're going from this stage to meet with Secretary of State Kerry to continue your discussions. Um, are you headed for an agreement with the West on your nuclear program or a confrontation? Oh, we, we're certainly prepared to go for an agreement. I hope that we don't have a confrontation. Confrontation doesn't help anybody, but if it comes to the point that in order to defend our dignity, we need a confrontation, then we will not shy away from that. But I do not believe that is necessary. I do not believe that 10 years of confrontation has produced any positive result for anybody. As I told you, 10 years of sanctions have produced 18,000 or 19,800 centrifuges, exactly what they wanted to avert. And it has produced economic hardship on the, on the Iranian people. So it's, it's a classic example of a negative sum game or a lose-lose game. Uh, there, there is a need to approach it from a different perspective. Now, we have, we set out last year when we agreed in Geneva, uh, two goals. One is for Iran to have a peaceful nuclear energy program, and that is the right of Iran to have. Uh, and in fact, all in our analysis, I mean, there are always uh, different narratives about why a crisis exists, and we, we need to listen to all the narratives. People believe that Iran pursued a less than transparent uh, nuclear program, and we believe that we pursued a nuclear program because we were deprived of the means of, of uh, trying to gain that peaceful technology from uh, open market sources. Unfortunately, we couldn't even get fuel for a reactor that the United States built in Tehran in the 1950s under the Atoms for Peace program. And we needed to go to Argentina, of all places, <laughs> to get fuel for that in the 90s. And then we started to almost beg for that fuel uh, after the fuel from Argentina ran out, and nobody provided it to Iran. So we had to make and manufacture the fuel ourselves. This is the problem of chicken and egg. So the first, the first uh, goal that we set out for ourselves between Iran and the EU 3 plus 3, which include, in fact, Russia and China, and not just the Western countries, was to, for Iran to have a peaceful program. And the second goal was to make sure that this, this program uh, is, is exclusively peaceful and all the constraints and sanctions on Iran will be lifted. Now, we have uh, come a long way. We have discussed many alternatives. And I believe if our European friends, and particularly if the United States, abandons the hope that they can have the cake and eat it too, as they say, that they can keep the sanction and at the same time have an agreement with Iran. That will never happen. I mean, sanctions for them were designed to serve a purpose. Now the purpose is at hand. We can, in fact, achieve an agreement that will provide the guarantees that Iran's nuclear program is and forever will remain peaceful. And we are all for it because we believe that nuclear weapons have no uh, positive uh, impact on our security. In, in fact, we believe nuclear weapons uh, are detrimental to our security. And mind you, to the security of anybody. We do not believe that mutually assured destruction or MAD is a recipe for uh, good living for, for anybody. I do not believe that nuclear weapons prevented the United States from falling victim to the tragedies of 9-11. I mean, you, you had them and nothing happened. I mean, there were, uh, you were, and, and New York was blown up by, by a bunch of uh, fanatics. So it is important for all of us to abandon the illusion that nuclear weapons are the panacea for uh, resolving all the security problems. And I believe the nuclear five need to reach that conclusion too, not just uh, the, the non-nuclear weapon state. But we're very happy to be a non-nuclear we weapon state and to remain a non-nuclear weapon state. And we're very happy to provide all the assurances that we do not want this deadly device. And our, the, the, the religious verdict in Iran is that these weapons are inhuman and are against our very fundamental principles. So this, this is where we stand, and we have nothing to lose by reaching an agreement. And we are prepared for an agreement, and I believe we can have an agreement soon. There are those who do not want to see an agreement. There are those who believe conflict and tension would best serve their interests. I think they are badly mistaken, but unfortunately there are a lot of them around and a lot of them have a lot of influence on, on US Congress and a lot of them uh, are pushing US Congress to in fact derail 
the process and torpedo the process. And that is why yesterday uh, the foreign ministers of Germany, France, UK, and the High Commissioner of the European Union wrote an op-ed, which I didn't like, in the Washington Post, uh, urging them not to go ahead with this. So th this is where we stand. There are people who want to torpedo this. And I, I think everybody should stand against that. Yeah. What will Iran's response be if the United States Congress does pass a piece of legislation setting up new sanctions? Well, I, I believe uh, Iran doesn't have to respond to that. It's the international <laughs> community. We, we have an agreement. And that agreement has the prospect of reaching a comprehensive agreement. And if somebody comes and torpedo it, I believe it should be isolated by the international community, whether it's US Congress or anybody else. And I believe now it's, it's the time for the international community to stand firm against a process that will unravel an, an extremely important achievement. So a sanctions bill by the United States Congress will unravel the negotiations? But a sanctions bill by the US Congress will, will kill uh, the joint plan of action that we adopted last year in Geneva. Now, the president of the United States has the power to veto it, but our parliament will have its uh, uh, counteraction. And in our constitution, the president doesn't have the power to veto a parliamentary decision. So it will be out of our hands. If the United States Congress were to adopt a legislation, our, our parliament will retaliate, mm -hmm. sort of. The president can veto theirs. I don't know what we can do. And that legislation, this retaliatory legislation, would do what? I don't know. I mean, it's up to, it's up to our parliamentarians. They have threatened uh, publicly uh, that if the US Congress were to adopt a uh, legislation, they will adopt something requiring the government that if new sanctions were actually imposed on Iran, that we will increase uh, our enrichment. Mm -hmm. Now we have uh, stopped enriching 20%, which we needed for the Tehran reactor, uh, which I said we were deprived of the fuel for. Uh, there are other requirements that Iran has for even higher grade uh, enrichment, and they are asking for that. So there are uh, all sorts of possibilities, and I do not want to entertain them, because I believe uh, there is a possibility, a very good probability of reaching an agreement. And, and we should not waste that opportunity. And Secretary Kerry and I, along with other uh, ministers, I visited uh, Berlin and Paris, uh, and I have spoken to other friends over the phone, and we are insisting on, on pursuing this. Let's turn to the Korean Peninsula. Uh are sanctions making the Korean Peninsula safer or more dangerous? Well, uh, well, I come back to that question, but uh, I'm one of those who are very eager to see uh, a very good news out of these ongoing mm -hmm. talks between Iran on the one hand and the P5 plus one, because uh, that, through that, through that successful agreement, uh, North Korea could have some lesson, very important lesson. But now we are using a two-track strategy against the North Korea sanctions from the United Nations and some uh, like-minded countries. On the other, we are also pursuing kind of a negotiated settlement through six-party talks or some kind of, some kind of mini-lateral talks, trilateral consultations as well. Now, I think to a certain extent, sanctions are working because now North Korea is in a very dire strait economic plight, many problems, shortage of uh, foreign uh, exchanges. So now they are, inst uh, they are now at the ve in a very difficult relations with China because of these uh, nuclear problems. And now they are trying to reach out to Russia, but even Russia is very much principled about these uh, uh, nuclear issues. So they are very much isolated. But nevertheless, North Korea is uh, still continuing to sticking to their position of uh, continuing this nuclear weapons development. The, their constitution said they are already nuclear weapon state. So if they are right, they are now the ninth de facto nuclear weapon state. But Nobody in the internet community can allow that, tolerate that. So our, our objective is CVID, comprehensive, verifiable, and irreversible dismantlement of North Korea nuclear weapons. And uh, for that, we are working very closely with all the important key players, US, China, Russia, Japan, and EU, and many others uh, here, present here. Hmm. So another thing we see on the Korean Peninsula is, I guess, what we could call the rise of war by other means. Um, <laughs> there have been many cyber attacks in the last few years, but the one now attributed to North Korea on the uh, Sony Corporation 
got more attention than I think all the others put together. Um, what is this telling us about both about North Korea and about the state of warfare in the world right now? Well, we have a sense of deja vu for many, many years. So they are linking everything to everything, you know. Uh, since 2009, we have gone through a series of cyber attacks uh, on the uh, banks, uh, government institutions, and many other the, uh, the, uh, you know, companies. But now when I saw this uh, attack on the uh, Sony Pictures, uh, now they are now trying to uh, the, uh, to say that, uh, well, uh, unless uh, the, uh, uh, they discontinue this kind of uh, you know, negative, uh, you know, uh, negative uh, the campaign against North Korea, uh, they will hit the uh, White House, uh, even they will hit uh, Korea's presidential house. So this is very much incredible argument uh, because uh, 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 cyber attack, uh, cyberspace should be uh, utilized for the common purpose. Uh, so now Korea, as the, uh, as the previous chairman of the uh, cyber conference, we are now trying to work very hard on how to adopt a new kind of norm to uh, reconcile all the different interests of uh, the countries. Hmm. Dr. Van der Leyen, how much of your time as defense minister is taken up with this kind of warfare? Um, quite a bit, because... Um, as we see, we have, we do not, wherever we look at the crises, it's not only uh, the conventional types of warfare anymore, but uh, the cyber dimension uh, the, uh, is getting stronger and stronger. So uh, we have to be prepared for that, um, as well in defense, as well as knowing what kind of attacks uh, are uh, the possible ones. And uh, specifically, uh, we have to think in these terms that the attacks on other things but military fields like banking system um, are way more um, difficult to predict in the way they will hit. Uh, and therefore, there is a lot of emphasis. Even here at the WEF, we had a lot of talks about this topic, which will be certainly one of the major domains in the future. Mm. So um, the interconnectivity about the internet globalized and uh, uh, the possibilities of cyber attacks are the, the warfare of the future or the conflicts, the potential conflicts of the future. So we have to invest a lot of knowledge and a lot of work uh, to solve um, these problems, to get uh, a set of rules, uh, international ones, to which uh, the majority obeys to and to define um, where the limits are and uh, what uh, the architecture of security is within the cyber topic that we want to establish and that we want to um, follow. Mr. Zarif? Well, we should not forget that North Koreans did not invent this. The United States started a cyber warfare against Iranian nuclear facilities some time ago, uh, and it could have led to a catastrophe with huge environmental implications for ordinary citizens trying to disrupt uh, our nuclear facilities. So it is important to deal with cyber warfare. It is important to deal with uh, this type of activity that can have uh, irreversible consequences, particularly when it comes to catastrophic accidents, as they call them, uh, with Iran's nuclear industry. They did it with our uh, heavy water reactor in the process of being built. They did it with our enrichment plant. Uh, they, uh, 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 and this is dangerous, not, not, not only unacceptable in terms of uh, uh, banking and, and other financial institutions or, or Sony pictures, but it is dangerous when it comes to nuclear facilities. Let me move us to what, until perhaps this year, had been the dominant geopolitical issue for, for quite a number of years, which is the world economy. And let me start with both of our Asian representatives, and ask you a question about China. China is now something like a third of the growth in the world economy in, in recent years, and yet now China's starting to slow down. Are we at a point where we have to worry about another recession brought on by the slowdown in Asia? Well, uh, I'm not an economy expert, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we see a lot of reports on, on, on that. Uh, but. Uh, uh, when I talk with uh, many Chinese colleagues, uh, still uh, they have a very strong belief that uh, uh, their growth uh, will continue despite certain ups and downs. 
So you should not underestimate the potential of continued growth. But nevertheless, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, to reinforce this kind of weakness in our Chinese uh, economy. We need to cooperate in more the uh, regional uh, you know, cooperation, economic cooperation uh, in the form of, uh, for example, the uh, FTAAP or TPP or RCEP, even uh, many bilateral FTAs. Uh, we have recently concluded a bilateral FTA with uh, China and many others are now doing that. So in that way, we could reinforce these weak links uh, among the countries in the region. I'm not also an uh, economist either. Uh, we think that with the uh, China rise in, uh, economically, it can uh, create opportunities for the countries, neighboring countries. Uh, for example, Vietnam. China is the biggest uh, trade partner of Vietnam. Uh, every year we have the uh, trade volume about 60 billion US dollars. And surely, let the trade uh, promote the economy, the development of the economy of Vietnam. And if the slowdown of the economy of China, so it can affect the uh, trade, for example, investment. So that is the, the way we see. Mm. Minister Zarif, let me just ask you about oil prices. Of course, to much of the world, this is good news. Is uh, the collapse in oil prices good news or bad news? Well, if, if my friends are not economists, I'm a total illiterate in that field. <laughs> but, There's but, a lot of humility here this morning. <laughs> but uh, the drop in oil prices, and there is a question whether the, the entire uh, spectrum of drop in oil prices is entirely economical, or whether they're political ingredients, and what are the purposes of that uh, political dimension of the oil cry, uh, of, of the drop. Uh, but for Iran, uh, according to Wall Street Journal, uh, among the countries that will uh, be harmed by the, the drop in oil prices, in terms of the percentage of their uh, GNP, Iran is number 20. Of the 35 countries that will be harmed, Iran is number 20. Some of our friends who are driving the oil prices down are number four and five. So they will uh, be harmed by, uh, much, much uh, greater than Iran will. Now, we have reduced our dependence on oil in our budget from uh, something in the neighborhood of over 50% to something in the neighborhood of 30% now. Uh, this has been imposed on us by, by the drop in, in the oil oil prices, which is somewhat good. And uh, in terms of the area I'm an expert in, and that is our negotiations on the nuclear issue, it reduces the impact of sanctions on Iran. Because now the oil prices are, are lower, the, the amount of, uh, I mean, the, the impact of oil prices and, and one of the most important areas of restrictions on Iran is the amount of oil we can sell. Since uh, the oil prices are low, uh, the impact on our economy is by far less than it was eight months ago or nine months ago. So the economic implications are that we are less interested in a deal and therefore less prepared to give concessions for a deal than we were a year ago because we have less to gain from a deal. And it may have, may have worked exactly in the opposite direction of, of, of the intended way. And there are people in Iran who believe we will gain by this, because they believe we will have to rely less on oil and more on, on uh, internal taxation, on uh, government austerity measures, on discipline, on economic discipline. This government, the, the current government in Iran, was able to reduce inflation and uh, improve uh, growth rate in the country, not by any new revenues that we achieved, throughout last year, because last year we didn't get anything new. All we got through these discussions and agreement was that there were no further uh, sanctions on Iran. The previous sanctions are all still there. But we went from uh, an economy that was in the, in, in the red, uh, negative growth, to an economy with 2% growth, from 40% inflation to uh, now 16% inflation according to the latest statistics. So we can do that through discipline. And the less we rely on oil, the more we are able 
to, to gain this, and we call it resistance economy, so that we will be resistant to external factors that are there in order to impact our policies. A quick response from yeah, Dr. Van der Leyen. <laughs> this was very interesting. I said something provocative. Yeah, no, no, it was not provocative, but it was very interesting to hear that you talked quite a lot about the impact of the oil factor on the sanctions and what the sanction did to your country. And earlier you told us that sanction didn't have any effect on your country. So this is contradictory, No effect I think. on policy. Oh, I think I they said... had an effect on policy because I think the negotiations would never, ever have been at the place where they are, thanks God right now, if we wouldn't have had the sanctions, because obviously the sanctions had an impact on your country, no, uh, which is the good, good should, part should of I, it. Should I respond to Please. that? Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> That's what the you, discussion is for. You see, <laughs> if, if sanctions were the driving force of our negotiations, the negotiations provided us with the possibility of gaining over $7 billion in transactions. All Iran used in the last seven or eight months is less than a billion dollars. If sanctions were the driving force, we would have jumped on it and used all the seven billion dollars. We didn't. The reason our government is at the negotiating table is that we want to change the dynamics of our relations with the rest of the world. Not that sanctions, sanctions hurt people. It's clear. And we believe sanctions are unjust, sanctions deprive Iranian people of the possibility to buy medicine because your banks are not prepared to transfer money for them. No, no, they, they, no. Uh, I mean, <laughs> legally I mean, they are, but reputation cost beg prevents them from doing that. I mean, no. this is, this is no. clear. No, no, but, but the point is, I mean, you asked for this question, so yeah. I'm giving you an answer. Go ahead. <laughs> the point is... But come that, to an end sometimes. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Sanctions did not bring the government to the negotiating table. If sanctions had brought this government to the negotiating table, now we would have moved away from the negotiating table. They didn't. We want to change the nature, the dynamics of our relations, and I think everybody will be better off if that happened. The one point with the sanctions are, and that was the, the beginning of our discussion, is what is better, to have a military intervention the hybrid warfare we see in the Ukraine, or is it better to react with an economic answer? We think the economic answer is always the better one to a potential military aggression than a military reaction, because this does not bring us anywhere. And the sanctions are always only a vehicle to bring you at a table and us at a table to negotiate. For example, with Russia now, it's the agreement of Minsk that has to be fulfilled. That's the goal, that where we want to go to. And the sanctions obviously were at least, we never like them. They are harmful to all of us, but they are the better instrument to bring people at a negotiation table than a war. And that's why sanctions sometimes are to be imposed. So it's why are good, you not abandoning them good even to af find, after we are at the negotiating yes, table? We need a, I think it's very good if we come to an end that's the goal. We have to have at the very end an agreement everybody sticks to. Same in Russia and Ukraine. We have the Minsk agreement. We want to see that it is fulfilled. In the Minsk agreement, we had the OSCE, we had Russia, we had the separatists, and we had the Ukrainian government at one table. They signed the agreement. So what we want to see now is that it is put in place. You know, that is... The, uh, the, the real truth behind an agreement or behind negotiations. So if we come to an end with the negotiations, this is good. We can come to an end with sanctions. But at first, the negotiations have to go to a good end. All right, I'm going to have to call it end to okay. this part of the conversation, although if the two of you would like to stay after and continue, yeah. you're more than welcome. We um, we're basically out of time, and I just want to give each of you a brief uh, opportunity to wrap up. Uh, we've talked about... Uh, Economics, obviously, we've talked about sanctions, about terrorism, uh, some big issues we haven't talked about, like climate and, uh, and jobs and environment. But I want each of you now, uh, starting right here with Dr. Van der Leyen, uh, to tell us what you think the most serious threat is for 2015. Oh, my God. Somewhat briefly, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have to understand that economic development and security are two sides of one coin. And if we keep that in mind, uh, we will be successful in uh, tackling 
the threats ahead of us. Well, as you know, Korea is a divided nation uh, confronting North, within North, North Korea, within uh, across this DMZ. Uh, my nightmarish scenario is that uh, uh, someday, uh, even though we are trying to deter the possibility, but uh, someday if North Korea uh, turns out to be uh, the uh, turn out, turn, turn, that, uh, masters this uh, nuclear weapons technology, and then uh, uh, translate this uh, miscalculation into some kind of action, that could be a nightmare scenario. But uh, working together with our friends, uh, we are trying to prevent that from happening. Ben Benmin. Yes, uh, in uh, our region, I see the security, uh, security threat as a territory dispute may happen in uh, East Sea or South China Sea. So that could be fair, uh, a threat to uh, the sta uh, stability in, in the region. Mr. Zarif? Well, I, I, I think two, two problems uh, may emerge as, as new security challenges for 2015. One is the return to Cold War politics uh, and to Cold War uh, geopolitical uh, rivalries. Uh, it's impossible to go back to the 90s or to the 80s, but we see ingredients of that, and those ingredients are detrimental to both regional and global security. And that, I think, is a very major problem. But more importantly, I believe extremism and the way to deal with extremism are our main challenges. Now, we, we've seen extremism in our region, in Europe, elsewhere, uh, what it can do. But the way to deal with extremism by, by pushing people to, to further uh, exclusion, pushing people to further uh, periphery uh, of, of international system, uh, is a is, is very dangerous phenomenon, particularly when it comes to ostracizing an entire population in Europe and uh, basically insulting the values and the sanctities of Islamic religion becoming a norm uh, in, in, in certain European societies, which feed extremism, which feed uh, this feeling of disenfranchisement. I think these are very serious challenges and threats that we're facing right now. And our final word from our business representative. Yes, I'll answer in the terms of business risk. And, and I think a risk which is completely underestimated is the development within the EU and Europe. We've had six years of recession. We just launched probably the biggest uh, financial package. There are very few structural reforms. And the current crisis in Eastern Europe that we have could have very, very severe impact on uh, the Western European economy. And that was why I was uh, interested when you started speaking about China. China grew ten tenfold of EU last year, tenfold. And I think that with the risk of going into the seventh year recession, which is real because of lack of structural reforms in many countries, because of the impact of the, of the Russian crisis, is something that would, you know, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a you know, social standpoint, will be difficult to bear in Europe. And I think that is uh, somewhat estimated by many people. Well, thank you all very much. A very robust debate. We clearly could go on for another hour. Uh, and I'll stay if you'd like to. But we do have to call an end to this AP Davos debate. Thank you very much.